No, I'll stay where we at. I told you what, I think I got everybody here at 6 I'd like to call the study session to order on Tuesday, March 14th at 5.35 p.m. And we're going to start with uh, the turn. I've lost my paper. Turn around. Oh. The turnaround plan presentation district. Thank you, Governing Board members, for allowing us to uh, present for you today. I gave you a sheet, and that's probably the very and most important sheet uh, that you will need to understand our plan. But I'm going to start with the accountability clock. And if you turn to the page that says that, I believe I've highlighted an area for you. Now, this area, the, the top part says, per state law, schools and districts cannot retain one of those plans, meaning priority improvement or turnaround plan, for more than five consecutive years before significant action must be taken. And then if you scoot down a little bit further down, I've highlighted another section for you, and it says, the local boards will be directed by the State Board of Education as to which strategy or pathway to pursue. And then one more area that I highlighted for you down there, it says, school districts may also provide a proposal for the preferred pathway to the state board. And that's why we are here today, because we want to show you the pathway that we are going to select. If you go and turn that page over to the other side, it'll say accountability clock pathways. And I want to make sure that everyone in our district is on the same or has the same information. So you see, I, I've highlighted for you, it says charge in management. That is the pathway that we are choosing for the district. That is the pathway that has been chosen for the high school. Okay? With that, bond, with that background information being said, let me give you a little bit more background information. I believe two years ago, the district voted to go the pathway of innovation. That was two years ago. Uh, the state review panel also came in, and they did their walkthrough, and they said, uh, suggested also innovation zone. But since that time, it's been two years, you've hired a new superintendent, and we have had ongoing weekly meetings with the Colorado Department of Education, and they have sent a representative to help us. Her name is Lisa Medler, and she is here today. So we want to thank her for being here. And she also represents a commissioner uh, from the Colorado Department of Education. But talking with Ms. Medler, she got us to focus more specifically on a high school and to focus on what we really needed in our district. So because of that, we started looking at the high school. And we said, the high school, the main area of improvement, it has to be math, language arts, because that's what we get scored on. So we were talking to the high school uh, staff, and we said, what do you need? What, what's missing here? And what the teacher said is they wanted a consistent and structured curriculum. In other words, curriculum maps. They want to know what to teach, when to teach it, and for how long. They also said they wanted more resources because we lacked that at the high school. They needed quick assessments, not assessments that we do like every eight weeks, but something we could do every two weeks uh, or sooner. And also, once the students were assessed, they wanted to figure out a way on how to help the students immediately that did not master the standards. So because they said all those things, uh, we started researching a little bit. And when I saw the pathways, they had one of external management. So I thought of Beyond Textbooks, and, if, uh, and this is an outside external partner. And I had success with Beyond Textbooks in Arizona. So I asked the CEO, would you possibly come into Arizona and do a presentation for our schools? And they did. And they did a presentation for Rose Hill for Central and for the high school. And I believe some of the board members were, were there, and I want to thank you for being there. But uh, the schools really appreciated that, and they said that 
after the presentation, they said, we would be interested in, in having Beyond Textbooks with us. So because of that, we've continued to move forward. And we continue to have meetings with the um, Colorado Department of Education and our staff here. So from those meetings, we did choose a pathway external management. And we chose that for various reasons. We talked to the high school and we looked at their innovation plan, but we just thought that that may not be enough, that the external partner would be a little bit <coughs> uh, an easier path for us to convince the state board. Because remember, when we go in front of the state board, it is a proposal. They can say no to us, but hopefully we're going to have enough uh, evidence to show them that this is a good thing for us. So again, I, I want to reemphasize to our board and everyone here that our pathway for the district is external partner. Our pathway for the high school is external partner. Now, just to clarify too, the high school had done a lot of work on innovation, correct? But when we talked to them, they didn't need any state waivers. So we're getting an innovation plan from the high school, but their innovation plan does not have to go in front of the state board. It's only gonna go in front of our governing board. So they will be presenting their innovation plan to you next month. But the plan that we are gonna be discussing here today is the one that we're gonna propose to the state board. So did I explain it clearly? So, so I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, my understanding of beyond, beyond textbooks is for ninth grade, right? It is for ninth grade and 10th grade. We're going to implement it this year. Uh, okay. So um, what about the juniors and the seniors and what, what's going to happen with um, if for the, this year? Uh, for this year, they're just going to finish up their year. Our plan is for next year for the freshmen, sophomores, and then each year after that, we would be adding another grade. So... By the next year after that, we would have 9, 10, 11, and then the following year we would have the whole high school um, beyond textbooks. And I, I don't mean to not answer your questions, but I just was going to set the uh, framework for you, and then I'm going to have Ms. Burgos and Ms. Uh, uh, Hernandez present the other parts, okay? Okay. So th just, but I just want to make sure that everyone understands. The high school has an innovation plan. They don't go in front of the state board. They only go to you. Our external partner, we're gonna. That's our proposal for the the state board. Okay. Okay. And then I do have Miss uh, Medler here from the state board. Would you want to uh, hopefully just give the board a little bit of information on how how we sort of went from thinking about going innovation and external partner to, to just uh, external partner. Uh, good evening. Um, I am Lisa Medler from the Department of Education. It's really nice to see you again um, uh, to talk with you guys about the pathways. We met a few times last year, um, and uh, so it's nice to be able to come back and do a little bit of a, an update. Um, and really, all I'm going to say is, all I'm going to say is reiterating some of what Dr. Brago has already shared with you, and that is. Um, considering the transition in leadership at the district level um, and knowing that it takes time to set up systems uh, and considering what the options were, I've really spent this year working with district staff re-looking at some of what, some of what those pathways were um, because the department has also done more work to clarify what they meant. Um, and as we really dug in, I think staff realized that external management um, it sounded a little uh, scary, um, but as we dug in, it actually fit really nicely with some of where they already wanted to go. Um, the other thing I would want to say um, about the innovation planning, as other districts have engaged in this, what we're finding is that really solid um, leadership and infrastructure needs to be in place. And again, given some of the transitions, especially in the high school <laughs> this year, um, it just didn't seem like it was going to be a setup for success. Um, and as you heard Dr. Brago say, I've really been pushing the district to focus, not do everything that's possible, but really focus and do, th do a few things really well. So taking that into consideration as time went on, I really started urging them to think exclusively about external management so I think um, they just wanted you to hear that from me as well that this some of this is 
um, us talking back and forth, but also me pushing in certain directions as well. Um, so I think that's what they wanted me to say. And again, now we're going to give you a little bit more information. Uh, Ms. Borges is going to give you some information about our plan. Remember, we're going to a turnaround hearing, so some of the information she's going to share with you is well, how we're helping not just our high school, but we're also helping other schools in our district. And then if you have specific questions about beyond textbooks or our partnership, I have uh, Teresa here to answer those questions. I just have one question, because uh, you're right, we did approve an innovation and that they were going to do a plan and they were going to go uh, before the board, but now do, it's gone. Am I correct? Well, the, 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 it's, it's your yes and no. But I mean, we're still in the, the, under the, in the clock. I understand that, right. but I'm we're, just we're saying no plan. The only thing is that the innovation plan is at the high school. Right. Okay. Is that correct? So we still have, again, they had worked two years on that plan, so we didn't want to just put it away. Uh, so the high school is going to present their innovation plan to you, but not to the state board. For the state board, it's, we just have an external partner beyond textbooks, and that's what we're going to present there. That's what we're taking to the high school. And they did vote on that, the high school. And Ms. Burgos, if you want to explain the plan. Thank you for hearing me uh, at this time. And it's not my plan, it's the district plan. And I'm going to give you an overview about those uh, highlights. I'm going to tie the turnaround strategies that we're going to use across the uh, schools that are not implementing Beyond Textbook, as well as some strategies with Beyond Textbooks. So I want to just, oops, clicker. Our Adams 14 turnaround plan that we're presenting to the state board on May 10th has um, two parts to it. The bigger of the two parts is the external partnership with Beyond Textbook. And then we also have our district turnaround strategies. Now I'm just going to give you an overview and just highlight those things that, that are really important at this time. I believe you've all received the plan. Why are we here? Well. Adams 14 has consistently not met local and state expectations in both achievement and in growth. Consequently, Adams 14 has received a rating of priority improvement or turnaround on the Col Colorado um, School Performance Framework for five consecutive years, and it's been identified as one of the lowest performing districts in the state of Colorado. Based on performance, we have to choose a Adams 14 must decide on an accountability clock pathway that will have significant, immediate, and positive impact on student learning while concurrently supporting building leadership teams to address their specific building needs. After we looked at all the performance data, we asked why. Why are we where we're at right now at Adams, in um, Adams 14? So these are some of the things we found out that are also aligned with the root causes identified in the UIP. High turnover at the buildings and central leadership level. The school calendar, it lacked uninterrupted instructional time and unstructured school day at the K-5. There were lack of instructional resources aligned to the Colorado standards. Decision making, a lot of decision making, but it was not data driven nor was it monitored for implementation or effectiveness. And five is inconsistent implementation of research-based best first instruction. The root causes, there's three of them that align to those, um, to our barriers that we identified, one, three, and five. I'm gonna focus on three, four, and five. The plan addresses all of them. All of you received a copy of the plan so that you know we talk about high turnover, we talk about um, the calendar, we talk about instruction. I'm gonna focus on three, four, and five. So some of the things the district has done to date to address those deficiencies, the district purchased Benchmark. It's an English-Spanish literacy program, K-5. It developed and implemented an English language development and biliteracy plan 
It expanded the biliteracy program at the pre-K and elementary levels. It opened the first cohort of students to receive Spanish literacy instruction in grades six and eight at the middle school. It doubled student enrollment at Adam City High School in the seal of biliteracy pathway and nearly doubled the number of students who will graduate with the seal of biliteracy. It has organized instructional time for this, it really should say 17, 18 school year for grades K-5 to allow for extended learning opportunities. It has developed a three-week teaching assessment cycle. It has developed a five-year strategic plan to address the specific needs of the exceptional student population and received a, a multi-tiered systems of support grant to help some of this work. And this was led by Dr. Um, Fratney Allen, our Director of Student Services. So the, for the remainder of the time, I'm gonna talk about the systems framework that makes up the plan, but my focus will be instructional transformation. So these four components are addressed in the actual turnaround plan that we will be presenting to the state. We talk about talent development, we talk about turnaround leadership, and a culture of performance. But I will focus on instructional transformation. Why instructional transformation? I looked at some research. We looked at research actually before we even started to consider possible pathways and what we needed to do at the district level to turn things around. So I pulled this right from the uh, Colorado Department of Education, hoping we'll get some brownie points there when we present. <laughs> but, <laughs> and what it says about best first instruction is what I want to share with you. It talks about that everyone understands what best first instruction is in the field of education. But what's, what it says, it's not necessarily in place at the schools that need it the most. What we look for instead is an intervention to the solution of our student achievement gaps. And what we've come to recognize through the research is that, in fact, it takes best first instruction and appropriate aligned interventions in order to ensure that students catch up and keep up. Both of these areas need to be in place if educators are to make a difference with at-risk students. I pulled another, um, so it talked about, it went on to talk about what are those things that need to be in place. We call them frameworks, structures, systems. So it talked about the schedule, a schedule that needs to be aligned to provide quality instructional time. Instructional strategies that are planned, delivered, monitored to meet the changing needs of a diverse student population. Instructional services that are provided to students to address their individual needs and close the achievement gaps. Teachers need to be analyzing student work as well as test results to assess student progress and achievement, and to identify the gaps, and at times, they need to make instructional changes. And classroom assessments need to be frequent, rigorous, and aligned with the standards. I put just another re um, source of research, and I guess I don't know how it's lined up, but I'll read it. And this I pulled from uh, the Dep um, U.S. Department of Education regarding um, priority schools and turnaround. Once again, it talks about we need to examine school level data on student achievement to identify specific gaps in learning. We have, um, have teachers use formative data, that's your everyday data, about individual students to analyze their instruction, to look at what they're doing, and, and in light of progress, in light of student progress towards standards to establish priority areas of instructional focus and to make necessary changes in those areas to strengthen teaching and improve student learning. And to ensure that all school leaders and instructional staff monitor progress regularly and systematically make adjustments to strengthen teaching and student learning. 
Now, these are practices that are in place in schools like our, our school with um, students high in poverty, diverse um, languages, and at risk. These are things that schools put in place that in spite of these um, deficiencies, well, some would call it that, I call them challenges, we can still improve student achievement. The next thing that we did was we looked at every school specifically and the needs at each school and the experience of the building principal at each school. So these are our schools. And then with external um, partnership, we're going to go with three schools. As you well know, we've identified them. I might need to do something really quickly. And that would be a Central Elementary, Rose Hill Elementary, and Adam City High School. At DuPont, presently they are using a Connect to Success grant. And this grant has allowed them to visit other schools to pay teachers um, additional time so that they can dig deeper into the data to identify students who need specific um, and extended times to learn. And they've also implemented a flood model at um, DuPont. With the district turnaround strategies, we will, they will work at ALSUP, Kemp, Monaco, Adam City Middle School, and Kearney Middle, um, Middle School. And then we're also looking at potential leadership grants for the following schools, ALSUP, Central, DuPont, Kemp. At Monaco, we're looking for a di diagnostic, um, I'm sorry, a turnaround network grant. Um, and, and they look pretty positive. We're going to find out later this week, or hopefully no later than next week, whether or not we receive these grants. And at Kearney and Adams City Middle School, we have the Diagnostic Review Grant. At this time, it was a potential grant when I typed up the PowerPoint, um, but they actually did receive that grant. So now I'll talk a little about um, beyond textbooks. Once again, we have three focus schools, Rose Hill Elementary School, Central Elementary School, and Adams City High School. What does beyond textbook do? Beyond textbook provides both an instructional leadership framework as well as an instructional framework that focuses on curriculum, assessment, and intervention. And as the previous slide showed, that is what research says needs to be in place. Specifically, Beyond Textbook is going to identify the essential standards that need to be taught. They're going to talk about what defines the mastery of the standards. They're going to align the instructional and curricular sequencing to the school calendar. They're going to be selecting appropriately rigorous curricular resources, conducting appropriate interim assessments designed to measure student content knowledge mastery, conducting common formative assessments designed to determine which students need enrichment and which students need intervention. And they're going to identify, um, they're going to establish time during the school day for these interventions and enrichment opportunities. The district tur turnaround um, systems and structures that are going to be put in place, 17, 18, um, a teaching schedule designed to provide quality instructional time, instructional maps aligned to the Colorado standards, classroom assessments are going to be frequent, rigorous, and aligned with the standards. Teachers are going to have time to analyze student work so they can identify achievement gaps and make instructional changes. Instructional strategies are going to be planned, delivered, and monitored. And instructional services are provided to students to address those needs during extended um, opportunities to learn. So I have here um, the K-5 instructional day. And you can see that we've added to that at the beginning of the day 30 minutes. So the day is always going to begin with a meeting time where the teachers get to talk to the students. And you set the tone for the instructional day. 
There's going to be 180 minutes spent on reading, literacy, focusing on listening, speaking, reading, and writing. 90 minutes of math, basically set up to do whole group 20 minutes, 20 minutes of guided practice, 20 minutes where the students get to work independently or with the teacher in small group, and then 30 minutes of application. Now take what you just learned and apply it to a real world problem. 30 minutes of integrated social studies and science, and then 30 minutes of extended learning opportunities. And that's the time that our common assessments that will be um, administering every second and third week of the school year, teachers will look at that and assess which students need extra time to learn and which students need enrichment opportunities because they already have it. And we don't want to lose those students either. So just like beyond textbook, with um, the schools that are going to implement the district turnaround strategies, there's going to be um, formative assessment every day. And that's live time learning. What do the students know? It could be thumbs up, thumbs down. It could be a quick glance around the classroom. It could be a couple questions a teacher may ask via an exit ticket. We're going to have common assessments every second to third week of the school year. And then there's the interim assessments that we presently already use, and that is STAR, to make sure that they're aligning and that we're headed um, upward bound. So here's another, um, just to share, I mean, it's hard to read, but I just kind of will go through it. There's going to be a, a eight teaching cycles. There are two to three week cycles. Again, the common assessment is given. And that common assessment will be um, used to identify students not only who need that extended time to learn during those 30 minutes, but also extra time in after school tutoring that is going to be provided for the students every three weeks. And then something else that we have been working at on as a leadership team is that professional development that our teachers need. So we're already planning ahead to next year because every moment matters. We want to make sure that our teachers are given the professional develop development they need to provide the best first instruction and that they're given opportunities to share with one another. And we've already started that um, this school year w regarding the reading foundations. We're partnered up with CDE and all our K through third grade teachers are receiving um, professional development on best first reading instruction. Next year the K3 teachers will receive math professional development and the 4-8 teachers reading and we're going to continue that cycle once again. Why? Because our teachers need to be able to be supported, continue learning so that then they can turn around and provide that best first instruction. And so both the district turnaround plans and the Beyond Textbook, um, putting it all together, what we know we're going to be doing is mastery teaching and that there's going to be mastery learning for the students. So that concludes my um, short overview of the turnaround plan for the district. And I'm open to any questions and hopefully I can answer and if not I have a all my teammates here. There's a Roberts here and <coughs> Teresa's here and um, they're here and they can help as well. Any from I, I have a few. So being the newest board member here, I wasn't uh, here for the other curriculum that was instituted by the previous boards, but our kids are the victims here. How are you, being the leader of the district, going to address classroom size? Okay, because our, our classrooms are oversized with kids. Okay, you're talking about small groups, reading groups, and we don't have the staff to do that. How are you going to address the teachers that haven't bought into this new program? And our principal leadership. How are you going to address that and getting the right principals in the right school for, the, for our kids? I think that's where our problem is, is the leadership and the overpopulation of class, classroom. And um, I'm not sure if I can answer all your questions, board member, uh, but the, the most important thing here is I want to make sure that we're addressing the, the correct plan is our 
external partner, that everyone understands that. I, I know the question you have about classroom sizes. I don't think we can do that right now because that's an entirely different uh, task for our district where we're doing that through our budgeting process to, to determine how much funds we have and what we can do with our classrooms. Of course, if we can lower the size, we will do it, but it all depends on our budget. And But as far as the leadership and all those other things, those are just ongoing throughout the district. But I want to make sure we stay focused on specifically that the board understands what we're going to do because this is our first time doing the presentation. We're going to have to do this in front of the state board. We're only going to have 30 minutes, so from what I saw right now, we're probably going to have to be more focused on certain things for the state board on what we're trying to do here for the partnership to make sure that we can convince them that's, that's the pathway we're going to have. And I think, if I heard right, everybody said it, I think. You know, age is catching up with me. <laughs> um, I think you said one of the main criteria was uh, getting the right leadership structured in each school. That's our key word right there, mm -hmm. the right leadership. And I think once you get that in place, things will start trickling down. And, and I think if you see our plan is we're developing our future leaders. We're sending our principals to uh, get the workshops that they need in professional development so that when someone does leave a position, the next person is ready and able to take over. That's in our plan also. I think that was one of the questions I had um, was about the professional development days. Right. This year they were kind of limited or I should say even last year, how often they did them because of the, you know, the subs coming in. How many, have you figured that out, how many professional development? Because, you know, it t it's going to take more than five, I'm going to say, because it's so detailed. Actually, with the school calendar, you are correct. Our um, professional development days are not as many as we've had scheduled this school year. However, we've been increased instructional time. We've also um, given teachers additional time in the in next sc uh, year's school calendar for meeting and getting their work done because that's, so in order to balance it across the board, give, add additional instructional days for student learning, give teachers more time to do the work they need to focus on, and at the same time provide professional development. We at least have one full day every quarter and it's going to focus on reading and math. And I think those are the areas we need to grow most in, plus the t uh, principals still have at least once a quarter uh, early release day, and they're going to focus then specifically on their school plans. Again, um, we will always be monitoring and revisiting, so depending on next school year's feedback, we might even um, revise the calendar yet again for the 18-19 school year. One of the things you said and I don't know if this is the right time, but I like the assessment every couple of weeks because in previous years, they were too far apart to find out really what the children were doing. So I think the closer, because I've worked in the schools, uh, and many, 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 many years ago, they used to assess every couple of weeks. So you kind of monitored and knew what the children are doing. Wh who was grabbing it, who wasn't, you know, who, who did you have to work with? And in those days, they used paras right. to c help tutor those children. And those are, those are in our plan. They're called okay. formative assessments, where we do it every two weeks, at where we uh, okay. assure that students is mastering the standard. But I guess the most important thing I want to make sure I'm, I'm bringing out to the board is that we are going to go in front of the state board the pathway that we are proposing is the external partner with Beyond Textbooks. So we have to convince you first that that is a good plan because we're going to need your support when we go in front of the state board because you will be with us. And we're going to, the superintendent and the board is trying to convince the state board that this is what we feel is good for our students. It, it has all the components that we need and please allow us to use this pathway. Again, if we convince them in those 30 minutes, then they'll allow us to do that. If not, they may choose a different one for us. I have a question. Um, first, I want to say thank the staff for putting this presentation, and I'm sure um, the research was a lot of work 
and I appreciate all you've done just to bring it to us in that 105 pages was a lot of work, and I do respect y'all for doing that. I'm not going to nitpick, but um, on my page seven, it doesn't have the 10th grade on there, and I noticed that the 10th grade is on yours, ninth and 10th, so right. we don't have the ninth grade, so I'm sure that y'all just add that to it. Okay. That is correct. We are going to have the ninth and 10th grade. Okay. Um, on page seven, I noticed that after reading last week two schools came in from the CDE and had um, presented their presentation, they talked about finance. I noticed that you put the $1.2 million for benchmark reading, but you just added the $1 million that the board approved, but you didn't break it down what the $1 million was as far as finance was concerned, as far as the 419 went for the textbook, even though we know that's for the um, beyond textbook, but it's not breaking down to what right. the $1 million is. And I read that they asked about the finance in there in that question. And, and that's very important. As I said, this is our first presentation. We know we're going to have to refine it because one thing that the state board wants to know is as state uh, as governing board members, how are you uh, supporting the turnaround plan? And I thought that was very big, and so did the state, where we said that our governing board allocated one a uh, million dollars for curriculum instruction, and we'll break that down that some of that was or about 50% is going to be technology. The other 50% was to have a more rigorous curriculum and this partnership. But again, we need these questions because when we go in front of the state board, we have to have our, our plan finalized and be able to convince them. And on page 39 and 40, um, is the percentage supposed to be 100% because they're not? A lot of men. 100% for? Different questions on page 39 and 40. A lot of them don't add up to 100 percent. Some is 93, 92 percent. I don't have the document in front of me, so. Um, page 39 and 40 of the presentation. Was that a, a vote or was that? Uh, yeah, it's on both pages. It's um, 39, then it goes to the top of page 40 of the percentages. They're not equaling. 100%. Some is and some not. And I was just curious how, how come they wasn't equaling 100% and they're not telling why they're not equaling 100%. Okay. And my next question is, um, last year the board approved Hope Online Academy, which is not doing, which is a charter online school. That wasn't addressed in this presentation as far as the packet we got. And I'm sure Hope, uh, Ms. Melika testified to this that they is on the um, priority improvement to turnaround status too. And if the board is using um, Hope Online Academy in this district, which they in in several other districts, should not be addressed to what are we doing with Hope Online? I, I really don't think it would be uh, for this because again, our focus is just to get a pathway chosen with the state board. Our pathway is going to be the external partnership and the external partner is gonna be beyond textbooks. That's the only thing that we, we have to focus on when we go in front of the state board. Last question, because we have a executive session, is I thought, and maybe I didn't hear it because I came in late, is that when we do uh, Beyond Textbooks, it was supposed to be Central, Rose Hill, Kearney, Freshman Ave, City. But I also thought we were going to implement fifth graders at Camp, and Hanson, so when they went to we do. Uh, Kearney, are we still going to do that? Yeah, the, the okay. part of the plan is still with the high school, uh, Rose Hill, Central, and the two fifth graders that are going to be uh, okay. uh, joining them. At this time, I'd like to recommend that we cut it because is Holly Ortiz waiting for us to call her? Uh, it, it's we're going to we're going to be calling a, a, an attorney. Oh, okay. I've been letting her know. Okay. So is there any last minute questions so we can move into executive session? Okay, I need a motion to move into executive session uh, for Colorado revise 224-6402 parentheses 4 uh, B legal advice uh, advice board to conference with an attorney for the purpose of Receiving legal advice on specific matters. So moved. Second. 
Second. Is there any discussion? Can we have roll call, Monica? Just Mr. Monica. Archuleta. Aye. Mr. Dryley. Aye. Mrs. Quintana. Aye. Mr. Rolla. Aye. Mr. Aye. Okay, we will now move into executive session at 6.15. Call this meeting to order on Tuesday, March 14th at 6.55. Can everybody please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence. At this time, I would like to uh, take the moment of silence for our, one of our former uh, teachers, uh, media specialist in our community for over 30 years, and her name was Roberta Altenburn. She was here from the late 70s until, what, the 90s? So take a moment of silence in her passed away on Sunday. I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can we have roll call, Monica, please? Mr. Achuleta. Here. Mr. Dryden. Here. Mrs. Quintana. Here. Mr. Here. Mr. Here. I need a motion for the approval of the minutes on February 28, 2017. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, can we have roll call, Monica? Mr. Achuleta. Aye. Mr. Dryden. Aye. Mrs. Quintana. Aye. Mr. Roller. Aye. Mr. Aye. Aye. I need a motion for the approval of the agenda. Mr. Rolla, I'd like to make an amendment to the to the agenda okay. uh, to remove item 1.7 as it's not ready to for discussion yet. It's still in the red line process. 1.7, okay. We have a motion on the floor for the removal of 1.7. Is there a second on that? Second. Okay, is there any discussion on that? Can we have a roll call to, for the removal of this item, Monica? Mr. Achuleta. Aye. Mr. Dryley. Aye. Mrs. Quintana. Aye. Mr. Rolla. Aye. Mr. Thomas. Aye. Okay, going back, I need a motion for the approval with uh, motion to uh, amend 1.7. So moved. Second. Is there a discussion? Can we have roll call, Monica? Mr. Achuleta. Aye. Mr. Dryley. Aye. Mrs. Quintana. Aye. Mr. Rolla. Aye. Aye. Okay, moving on to celebra uh, recognition and celebration, Dr. Abrego. Yes, uh, Governor Board President, we do have two recognitions today, two schools. We will have DuPont Elementary, the GLB champion, followed by Kearney Middle School uh, pre-collegiate pre development program. So at this time, if we could have Pat from DuPont. Good evening, President Rolla, uh, distinguished board members, and Dr. Abrego. It's my pleasure to come this evening um, to recognize some students um, at DuPont Elementary School that participated in a competition that um, eventually led to, participate, to participation in a state competition and the teachers who made that possible. So on January 31st, 205 students from 4th and 5th grade participated in DuPont Elementary School's National Geographic's Geography B. Two days later, on February 2nd, the top two qualifiers from each participating classroom competed for a chance to move forward to compete um, to secure a spot as a finalist in the final round of the competition. From a pool of 16 students, seven qualifiers moved on to the next phase of competition 
by answering questions both orally and in written form about geographical locations and features in our nation around and around the world. And I'm telling you, listening to those questions, I was sitting there thinking, wow, I don't even know the answer to that, so this is very impressive. <clears throat> Out of a pool of seven arose our three finalists, Brian Savala, Abraham Carrasco, who was last year's champion, and Anthony Vasquez. Finally, after nearly an hour of fierce competition before a crowd of peers, teachers, parents, and other community supporters, Anthony Vasquez was named DuPont Elementary School's GOB champion. So at this time, I'd like to recognize Brian Savala, Come on up here. Brian? Mm -hmm. Brian, come on up. Come right up here. Abraham Carrasco, I don't think he uh, was able to make it, but he was here last week. He thought uh, that the board meeting was last week, so we'll make sure that um, he gets his certificate. And finally, our champion, Anthony Vasquez. <laughs> stay up here. You got to stay up here. I also would like to recognize Ms. Carissa Freeman. She organized the GOB, and she is our GT um, liaison at DuPont. So thank you for all of your efforts in making sure that students have an uh, opportunity to participate. And Mr. Judd Stutzman emceed the entire event, and he wasn't able to make it tonight. So thank you for this opportunity to recognize our GOB champions. And just to encourage you all in all your studies of geography, we wanted to give to you a Junior Genius Guide, Ken Jennings Junior Genius Guide to Geography. We have one more presentation. It's going to be by Kearney Middle School. Uh, if the principal will come up here, Ms. Jeffries. Good evening, President Rolla, distinguished members of the board, Superintendent Dr. Abrego. It is with honor that I want to recognize some students for their hard work and effort in our pre-collegiate development program, which is a program that is institutionally funded by CU Boulder in order to enhance our student success rate in college. Uh, it's designed to motivate and prepare first generation students to be successful at any college of their choice. Um, with me tonight, I have the counselors that run this program and the assistant director, Daniel, from CU Boulder, if you would come up. And if I could approach the bench, I'd like to just give you a brochure while we call out students' names that are already involved in this program on their way to college. Fernando Aragin. Brianna Cordova. Ari 
Rose Beth Cortez. Leonel Jimenez. Carlos Rojas. Jesus Vidania. Ashante Vichy. We also have Mariah Hernandez, Izzy Jara, Ryan LeBlanc, Laura Ortiz, Leslie Rivera, Emma Romero. Ana Soto. And that is all of our pre collegiates. I want to take the time to recognize our future college attendees that already have that zip line right into the university. Thank you, Daniel, for bringing the program to our school and counselors for getting them hooked up with our students. You are on your way to college. Don't forget us little people after you graduate, okay? <laughs> if we could get their parents up here to get a picture with them, please. You stay up here. Parents. Congratulations. 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 Students, if you have to leave because of your classes tomorrow, go ahead. Thank you. Thank Very you for good. coming. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> good night. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you. Sigue, sigue. I know which one's your bike. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. Thank, Thank you, you so job. much. Good job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Everybody from Thanks. the back can move up. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for all the help. You know, Thank you. There's no way I was going to come up. <laughs> check, check. And Mr. Rolo, those are all the recognitions that we have for today. We will now move on to audience comments. We have one individual, and that is uh, Mr. Guillermo Serna. Good night. Remember
member, Mr. Cerna, policy EDH. I know you know what it is. You've been here a long time, but just to state it, there's, remember, state your name and school district uh, where you belong, a maximum of three minutes. All statements shall be kept uh, relevant to district's concerns and uh, cons constructive criticism and motivated by sincere desire to improve the quality of education program. Uh, the president may recognize a board member or superintendent to respond to questions. Members of the public will not be recognized by the president during the board meeting. Okay, Mr. Cerna. Cerna, 14122, East 102nd, Commerce City, Colorado, 80022. I'm here because of the challenges that you may have in May with the state board. And just maybe a recommendation for you. Take the children that you have seen improvement these past two or three years. There's been a lot of accomplishments. But don't hold back also and ask for resources. Don't hold back that this district has been complicated by a lot of issues that you have struggled through <coughs> and have challenged you as board of directors. Take the children and the parents. You got 11 schools. Take one parent and one child, and you have a tremendous amount of resources from what I've seen these last two months on what the children can do, how they can speak, their accomplishments tonight. Don't let the state school board off the hook because of what happened in this district. They were just as much as fault as what happened here. That's just, that portion is just my opinion. Because <coughs> they could have gotten the resource. And we're still waiting for resources from funding that should be coming out of the marijuana pool. <coughs> and we haven't received anything yet. What has happened here should be an example throughout the state of their lack of direction and giving you knowledge of what could and could not be done, of how to run a board meeting. And you've been doing really great. <laughs> I'm just here to encourage you to keep moving ahead and take advantage of the children, take advantage of the community. Because what you're gonna see, and this is just me, okay, is the privileged white on that board. They don't know this district, okay? They have to see it in order to respond to the needs of this district. And they have to give this district the equal amount of time to recuperate because it took almost 11 years out of this district's existence to destroy it. And it's gonna take just as much time and resources to bring it back up. The children, as you can see, are ready to learn. All they needed was good leadership and the sustainability of teachers. Take a look at how many teachers you trained in perspective to giving them knowledge of what should happen in the school and in the classroom and how many of them left can because you, of what happened here. Can you wrap it up, Mr. Thank Chairman. you. That's all I have. It's just an idea for you because I think you're going to need every single thing when you go before the board. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Moving on to superintendent's report. Yes, we do have a Alsop Elementary School presentation. Are you ready? Uh, good evening, President Rolla, uh, Dr. Abrego, distinguished board members. 
I'm extremely excited to be standing in front of you again. Um, I know you guys get to hear from me a couple times a year. Um, you guys also know I like to talk, and I really want to limit my time tonight. So I've limited my slides to just some simple data, what I feel like is working well at the school, and where I feel like we need support. So I invite you to ask some questions when we're finished if I haven't explained something in enough detail. So I wanted to start out just by sharing um, our star data for our uh, February window. And I'm excited to report that I feel like we're trending in the right direction. Um, I also want to be really honest and tell you that there's still work to be done. Um, you can see some pockets where we're really strong. You can also see some pockets where we need to invest professional development in invest time in developing teachers so that we make sure we can help those students grow. So, but I will tell you that we did start PARC today um, and looking at the trending data for STAR and the way it's trending upward, it offers me a great amount of hope for PARC. Um, I feel very confident that I will stand in front of you in the fall um, with gr a great story about what ALSUP has done on PARC. Um, and I use that data to inform that. Um, and I also use what I see in classrooms every day and what my kids are doing. Um, as far as what's going well, um, I've talked to you guys about our workshop model before, but I think it's worth pointing out again because it is where we're getting our biggest gains. Um, and really in its most simple form, that's students explaining their thinking. We have kids working in groups. We have kids working with, a, with each other. And our teachers have become facilitators of the learning, and our students are the one discussing it helping each other, supporting each other, asking those questions. And because of that, you can't walk into a classroom and also without seeing conversations about learning happening with kids. Um, implementation of frames and starters. Um, we have a, a large population of second language learners and um, we support them by frames and set and starters for every lesson. So our kids have the structures to be able to explain their thinking, have the structures to be able to explain their understandings. Um, our implementation of CLOs, our, our content learning objectives, has really allowed us to focus our planning. One thing, the best instruction comes from quality planning um, and being ready to be in front of kids. So our focus on CLOs, I think, has really focused the instruction on what the learning needs to be for that day. Planning uh, for differentiation using our benchmark ass assessment system. Um, so three times a year, we level our kids in their reading text, um, and we provide individualized instruction based on what reading level they're at. And we use um, Fontes and Pinnell um, to kind of help us guide what needs to be taught to a student to move from one level to another level. Um, our number talks are going extremely well. They're happening in math classrooms. These are opportunities for kids to provide um, the opportunity to do mental math. Uh, because being able to write and script a problem is one thing. Being able to walk through the store, being able to walk down the street and compute what you need in your head is another skill that we spend time on math teaching our kids. Our continued partnerships with the community, we will once again be doing junior achievement. Um, we have a continued partnership with the Art Museum, who will be coming to ALSUP on May 2nd. They're bringing the Art Museum to us, which will be an exciting opportunity for the kids. Uh, and then last but not least, our STEAM Fridays, which we implemented this year. Um, these are opportunities for kids to tie their learning together for the week in, in some project-based learning. And what we like to see them do is apply skills they've learned throughout the semester um, into culminating projects on Fridays. And that's been strong as well. Uh, where do we need support? Um, I really want to start with PD time with teachers. Um, that is the bread and butter of what we do, is providing professional development to our teachers. Um, we have data from classroom walkthroughs. We have data from student achievement. But not having the, the time to really dig into that and provide professional development based on student need and teacher need um, is key. And I do feel like our, we have a lack of PD time with teachers um, at the building level. Um, I have concerns about the staffing for the implementation of the biliteracy. Um, I always want to make sure the right folks are in front of our kids. Um, and I am concerned as we continue to expand this um, biliteracy, um, are we going to have the right people in front of our kids? Do we have the staff that can help provide the right biliteracy instruction? Um, 
the program I have a lot of confidence in, and I believe it's what our kids need, and I believe we'll have success doing it. But in order to do it well, you have to have the right people in front of the kids. Um, my other concern is just what, what is the impact on the other staffing in the building? Um, for example, um, next year we'll have three first grade classrooms. One of those is a bi-literacy classroom. So we're looking at only two other classrooms for our other students. So I'm just trying to look at the big picture and that's something that um, I'm working through and I know that people in the district are working through, uh, but an area where I have some questions. Um, technology is always a, a piece that we talk about. Um, training technology, training our kids to use technology, um, having that right person in a technology classroom that can help our kids utilize that technology because they need to be able to do it. So it's about access, but it's also about teaching them to use it. Um, and last but not least, um, I would just say that I feel like we need an increase in mental health support and programming for students. Um, and I want to more clearly define that for you. From a mental health support standpoint, I think we need two things. Um, one is I think that we really need to work with our teachers on how to teach in a classroom where you have kids who have some trauma and some mental health needs. Um, not all teachers have that skill and it's a hard skill to acquire. Um, so I want to make sure that our teachers have the appropriate training. The other thing is that we have a lot of mental health support, but we tend to get caught up in putting out fires and working with high flyers when we have other kids in the building that have some trauma and have some severe needs that can sometimes get overlooked because all your resources are on your high flyers, um, if that makes sense. Um, and those are the things where I feel like we really need support. And you guys will thank me because I really did try to keep my word here. Are there any questions? <laughs> I got one. Sure. When you say um, PD for teachers, yes. Um, how many hours are you suggesting for PD for teachers in the calendar that's for the 17, 18 year school year? Well, and I, I would tell you this that I don't think anything that takes away from an instructional day is beneficial. Our kids need to be in class, they need to be learning from their teachers during the day. I guess what I would be looking at is how do we use some of this funding to pay teachers for after school professional development. Um, for me, example, I'm, I'm trying to use some of my title money this year to pay my teachers to have professional development from 430 to 530. Um, and so to me, I don't want to interrupt the instructional day and I don't want kids to miss more days of school. Um, that is not a benefit to students. Um, but I would be looking, how can we adjust funding to maybe support some of that after school um, PD? And what is your average class size? Since you're going to have three first grade classes, what would that take that class size? The other two in the biliteracy class, what would that do? Well, currently, I, I want to say my kindergarten is sitting at 71. Um, so you would be looking at around 21 in biliteracy um, and give or take 25 in the other two classes. Is that a normal size class for first grades coming in kindergarten? Because you might have some come in that's right. not in. in well, if you case. want my honest answer, I would tell you that I would prefer a smaller class size. That's uh, what I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would prefer uh, 21 to in a uh, first grade classroom. I would like 20 to 21 in kindergarten classroom. But I also understand the reality of projections, and I understand how that all works, and I respect that. Um, but I do think as you're right, as the fall comes around and those, if those numbers start to increase, um, I think we really need to be proactive in, in how we're utilizing teachers across buildings um, in case we need additional support in other buildings. Um, I'm not concerned as we stand here today looking at numbers, but those numbers can change in a heartbeat. And so I just want to be prepared for the fall. And I think my bigger concern would be as we move into third, fourth, and fifth grade, those numbers are very big. Um, so, you know, it's, it's having to, it's really putting thought into how, how we're staffing that program to make sure that all classrooms have the benefit of the mo the, a class size that will support the students. Um, so as I stand here today, I'm not concerned, but it is something in my head. I tried to put things that I'm thinking about down the road that, you know, I project could cause some issues. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Thank you. All right. Thank you guys for your time.
Our next report is going to be uh, by Kearney Middle School teachers that attended the music uh, conference. Are they here? No? Uh, then we also have Monaco Elementary teachers that attended the music conference. Good evening, President Rolla, distinguished board members, Dr. Abrego. My name's Cami. Uh, I'm the music teacher at Monaco Elementary, and I was lucky enough to attend the Colorado Music Educators Association conference this year. Excuse me conference this year, so I wanted to share a little bit about what I learned and how it's going to benefit my students at Monaco. I'm going to use the technology as best I can. Yes. Okay. So I wanted to give you a little bit of background on what the conference is and how it's set up. So per the website, uh, it's an annual conference put on by the Music Educators Association to serve the educational needs of our members and to provide growth opportunities to music educators regardless of their experience. So it's for all music educators in the state, no matter where you're coming from, no matter how long you've been teaching. Um, it's a four-day conference, and there are four categories. There's general, instrumental, vocal, and intra-university, which helps to bring um, university students who are studying music education to the conference before they've even begun so they can start their professional development early. Uh, many of the clinicians and presenters in all of the categories are uh, nationally and often internationally <coughs> recognized. Um, as an educator, you have the opportunity to choose which sessions to attend. So that's really important as music education changes across the state. What you're teaching is going to look different. In one district, you might have the same person teaching elementary uh, music and choir at the high school level, or band and orchestra, or any combination. So having these sessions that you can choose from um, allows us to really tailor our own professional development and then it also provides unique opportunities to network and collaborate with colleagues that's something that often as a, a specialist or a specials teacher we're the only ones in our building and in a smaller district uh, there's only seven of us in this district so it's really nice to be able to get ideas from outside of our district so I wanted to share some of the ideas that we that I uh, learned in the sessions that I went to so one of the presenters, the, the main presenter for the elementary, was Dr. Artie Alameda. And she was recently named the Florida Music Educator of the Year. Uh, and many of the groups that she directs are nationally recognized. And she's the author of 36 acclaimed teaching resources. So for this, this is Betty Botter. And that musically is going to help us with steady beat, uh, getting the rhythm, audiation, so hearing it in their head rather than uh, even if we're not saying it out loud. And of course, literacy integration. So the way that I would use this with my students is we would say the tongue twister with the steady beat so we're all together. Then I would move to having them say and clap certain shapes. So for example, all right, when we say anything that is in a box, then you have to clap it as well. So it would be Betty, Botter, Botsum, Butter, etc. cetera. Uh, then I would put in the instruments for different shapes. So this is encouraging uh, literacy-wise tracking. So they're continuing to read and continuing to have to pay attention. Um, and eventually, we'd get to the point where instead of saying the words, they would just be playing the instruments on the rhythm. So that's the audiation piece. Um, Dr. Alameda also provided these awesome rhythm rockets, which um, encourage rhythm, musical literacy, tracking, and engagement. The kids really love these. I use them with my first graders. So they sit back to back with a partner, and I'll clap a rhythm for them, one of the rhythms that's on the rocket. They have the rockets in their hands. They'll put a clothespin uh, next to whatever rhythm I clapped, and then they switch with their partners. And then I tell them which rhythm it was, and if they get it right, they get to blast off. And I don't know how to make the, show the video, but that's a video of my students. Um, Okay, I'm not sure how to make it work, but um, that's a video of my students blasting off. Oh, perfect. So they switched, and then they get to blast off. So it's just, they, they love it. And I had one first grader say, Miss, can we do this every single day? This is so fun. I was like, yes, <laughs> kill it. Um, something else that Dr. Alameda brought to the table is Note Man. So uh, I had my second graders do this and presented it as you are creating your own superhero. His name is Note Man. And there's a song, it goes to bingo, 
There was a man was made of notes and note man was his name, oh. And then for every verse, um, it talks about a different musical symbol and what part of his body it becomes. So this is, this is what note man finished looks like. Um, but there's also some other symbols that students can vote on and decide if they want it to be his hat, a mustache, a bow tie. Um, the kids really, really enjoyed this. This helps them practice their rhythmic symbols, work on their music literacy, and again, just the engagement of they're so excited to make their own superhero. Um, I also attended a session by Peggy Austin and Angela Monroe. And Peggy has been the music teacher at Superior Elementary in Boulder Valley School District for the past 10 years. Um, and Angela is working on her PhD at CU Boulder. So this session was all about composing and encouraging composition in the music room. So for our students, it gives them a chance to practice their musical skills, but also to stretch their creativity and take risks. And that's something that I've really struggled with um, with many of my students is that taking risks is very hard for them. And so this gives them um, the opportunity to practice that in a very safe and controlled environment. Uh, so it can obviously reinforce and connect with reading and writing at different grade levels. So with kindergarten or first grade, the students can create some sort of combination of sounds um, to represent a character in a story and then perform it when that character comes in. So one way we've done that is Billy Goats, the three Billy Goats gruff. So you have uh, a group of students that create the sounds for the troll under the bridge, a group of students that creates the sound of the different um, goats. So this, um, excuse me, this session also gave me a lot of ideas for tried and true progressions of different types of compositions and then parameters that can lead to success. So I'm, this, I'm only in my third year of teaching and so it's so helpful to be able to go to a 10 or 15 year veteran and have them tell me this works and no, this, this is not gonna work. Like, great idea, here's how you can make it actually work in a classroom. Um, and another example of that would be giving me appropriate assessment methods. Assessing uh, student compositions can often be difficult because you don't want to um, squelch their creativity, but at the same time you want to make sure that they are uh, following the directions. Another session I went to was by Danielle Bayart, and she's been teaching for 12 years in Jeffco. And she's a published author um, of the Music Center Handbook, so another teacher published. <laughs> So she gave me instructions and resources to create a blues band using elementary music instruments. So uh, in addition to that, she gave me a list of listening examples of the blues that are kid friendly, because often introducing the genre of the blues can be a little dicey, depending on what the lyrics, what happens with the lyrics, it can get a little crazy. So she had already gone through and kind of found the ones that really worked both to teach the concepts and also school appropriate. Um, our 12-bar blues ties to the Colorado Music Standard 1.2 perform more complex rhythmic, melodic, and harmonic patterns because it's leading into this um, pattern recognition and progression that gave me the tools and the inspiration for our upcoming fifth grade bluesicle. Musical blues, the kids don't laugh, but I think it's funny. <laughs> so we, I had the students write their own lyrics based on Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. Uh, they were assigned one section that's one or two pages long, and they had to summarize it in a blues verse using the parameters of the genre. So I know it's really small, but this is the last page of the book where he's talking about going to bed, and it's just been a terrible day, and I think I'll move to Australia. And so this is an example of my students' work. They wrote it in the uh, lyrical form of the blues, which is A-A-B. So my day was a terrible day. Oh, my day was a terrible day. I think it's time to hit the hay. So, and also one of the requirements was also that it had to rhyme. So coming up next for those students, because we're in process, they're going to perform their verses over the 12 bar blues harmony. And they're also going to provide the harmony for each other. So they're playing them on the xylophones and the metallophones. And ultimately, like I said, this will be our fifth grade program in April. <coughs> um, I went to a session by Kristen Lewis and Kate Klotz called Boom Boom Pow, Body Percussion and Hand Clapping Games. Kristen Lewis actually used to be the music teacher at Monaco Elementary. She was two teachers before me. And so I really wanted to go to one of her sessions because she had a unique perspective on exactly where I teach. She knows exactly what my students 
uh, are and what they're bringing to the table. So um, they taught a lot of different body percussion and hand clapping games. Talked about how that's something that students can practice at home, you can engage your community with. It's something that you really, you don't need anything except your voice and your hands to do. Uh, and they can practice anywhere. Uh, there's lots of different examples of what they can be practicing at any level. Steady beat, part work, audiation, again hearing. Uh, finally, I went to another session by Tanya Lejeune and Carrie Nicholas. Tanya has been teaching in Jeffco for many, many years, and Carrie Nicholas actually was the music teacher at Kemp Elementary for the past 15 years. This is her first year um, where she moves schools to be closer to her kids. So again, another teacher who really understands, you know, um, what it looks like in our district. So they had a lot of really great take and go activities that I can use as soon as spring comes up, which feels like now because it's so warm. Um, so lots of literacy integration, vocal exploration for kindergartners using the book Up, Down, and Around, tips on creating a thematic concert or program, just a lot of really good real world advice. So how can my attendance at CMEA benefit students in Adams 14 was the question that I was posed by the board. So it's an opportunity for me to explore new and different strategies for teaching to keep our students on the cutting edge of music education. Uh, it's a place to network and collaborate with other music teachers in Colorado, and it's guaranteed meaningful professional development that's specific to music. Often some of the great professional development that's offered in the district doesn't really apply to the music teachers or the art teachers. So this is an opportunity for me to go and make sure that I'm getting meaning, meaningful PD every year. Thank you. That was good timing. Uh, any questions? I just want to say, um, seemed like you had a real good time at your conference, and what you learned in your conference benefit our students, so thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you, too, because, you know, music does start when they're small, <clears throat> and I'm going to take it personal, because my, my oldest son, I started him on piano lessons when he was five. Oh, wow. So he continued on all the way into middle school, or, yeah, middle school, high school. You know, and to this day, he could pick up almost any instrument because he was capable to read the music and to play it by ear. So, and he's still doing it at, I won't say his age, but, you know, he's still doing it. Now he's trying to do the bass. So he's starting that young, really get some of the kids going. Absolutely. And I like, I like what your presentation. Thank you. With the yes. Just like to say thanks uh, because uh, it makes us believe that we are sending teachers to the right conferences. Usually we don't get reports back on what happened, but I really appreciate you coming back and telling us how you're going to help our students. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Abrego, is that it? That's it. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to routine items, consent items. Uh, personnel, a motion to accept the, the personnel items. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? <coughs> Hearing none, can we have roll call, Monica? Mr. Aye. 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 <coughs> okay, moving on to number two, business. Other? Uh, 1.1 superintendent's recommendation. I need a motion for the approval of the Nadine for the Adams City High School swim swim post, Joseph Snero swim pool, swimming pool. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? I, I have one question. Um, how are we going to, um, are we going to put his name on the pool or how, how are we going to dedicate it? That is up to the committee to come in and let us know, I would say. Yes. Can I, can I yes. Uh, so we actually, our art teacher at the school has, uh, students have already painted a mural, and his name is already up there. So it's, it's a beautiful mural. And it's at the pool? It's in, so yeah. It's right there. Inside or in the door as you walk in the hallway It's, it's there. inside, so it's, it's directly across from where the bleachers are. Okay. Yeah. Are, are you, you're talking about the kids at the high school uh, made that? Yep. Nice. Yep. Okay. I, have, I have a quick question. 
So if the board would have voted no and the mural was up there, they would have had to take it down because it seemed like it's beforehand that we're doing things prior to the board approving things. Am I, help me out with this. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm coming before you just to be as honest as I can. I thought it was a wonderful thing that the kids did with our art teacher. Um, this, was, this was put in motion, and I actually didn't realize that we needed um, the board approval, so I will oversee that better in the future. Um, but, but right now, if you do <coughs> approve it, it is a beautiful mural. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, I need a motion. I mean, I roll call, Monica. Mr. Archuleta. Aye. Mr. Dryling. Aye. Aye. Mr. Rola. Aye. Aye. Moving on to 1.2, superintendent's recommendation. I need a motion for the approval of the BSN Sports and East Bay for equipment purchases exceeding $15,000 uh, per policy DJ. So moved. So any discussion? I need a second, I'm sorry. Second. Second. Okay, is there any discussion? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Harvest. Please. Yes, As we're looking at your um, proposal to the superintendent, it says exceeding 15,000. 15,000 to what? 15,000 to 17,000, 18,000? It doesn't give us a specific number. It just said exceeding 15,000. Yes, uh, originally, um, after speaking with Sandra Rotella and looking at her budget, um, I was asking for 7,000 for BSN and 7,000 for East Bay. Uh, looking at our budget um, compared to last year and putting together that uniform purchase, um, I kind of looked over seeing what we could start purchasing, which we're still under budget right now. I th as I'm looking at it right now, um, we're about $80,000 um, that we're in pretty good shape. We already looked at what was encumbered and what is coming in terms of officials and transportation. Um, so I'm able to kind of get a jump step on getting uniforms for softball, uh, girls soccer. We're going to need football jerseys. This is according to the three-year cycle that you guys had asked for. So I was, I was really able to, again, as I, I think last time I spoke, I had mentioned how we were looking at creative ways to save some money. And based on our numbers, we've spent more money on uniforms and equipment. Um, than we have in the past four years, but we're we still have some money to spend. So, if I'm not mistaken, fifteen thousand needs to have a um, proposal sent out. Am I correct? Yeah. According to um, the board policy, anything over fifteen thousand needs to have. Yeah. Thank you. Don't, don't run off. Hi. Um, yeah, so really at $2,500 is when competitiveness is supposed to start per board policy. 10,000 is where formal solicitations are supposed to happen. Um, that didn't happen here. And so what's happened is uh, we noticed that he's reaching that $15,000 limit, which at least means going to the board for, for pre-approval. So both of those particular vendors are right, right there. And so he's asking for um, approval to spend above that um, again a lot of water under the bridge frankly and um, it's something that we'll have to take a look at a little closer next year um, but if we go going by quote unquote board policy he needs to have submit a bid for the 15,000 not water under the bridge board policy is that am I right or wrong help me out you're right. There's also the fact is he's already gone fourteen thousand plus on each one of those vendors. So we've already gone past past that ten thousand dollar mark. I'm not saying that's an excuse. I think it's a, a, a recognition that the fact that we've we've hit that limit. And so in his attempt, I believe, to try to meet your request as far as uniforms in particular, he's he's seeking to go above that fifteen thousand dollar mark. I'm, I'm still kind of confused because the board policy states anything exceeding 15,000 needs to have a name. A submit. Just Lear's brand. 
years. Is that right or wrong? And I, I, I brought my wrong glasses. I think, I think what you're saying is we need to know the exact amount. You know, 15000 you can get away with up to 15000 but we can't just approve a blank is what, if I'm, am I saying it right? No, $14,099 he can do. 15000 he has to submit a bid. 15000 he's supposed to submit a bid. Without those two vendors, he's supposed to submit at least three bids. Board policy. BD. Sir, what, what you're saying is you did 7000 on one and 7000 on the other one. Is that correct? Yes, and I'm asking for a limit. So I haven't gone over the limit for either BSN or for East Bay because they were different purchases. What Mr. Mickelson is talking about is I have multiple items to purchase, which will be bid out by three competitive vendors. But in order to spend what I have in the budget and get what's needed for kids in terms of equipment and uniforms going into next year, um, we have money in the budget to make more purchases um, for our students. Have, have these items been purchased already? No. Okay, and this is just for the high school? This is just for the high school. What, yes. about, what about our middle school kids? Our middle school kids? Well, their budget, and I've kind of looked at that, um, they, they're getting closer to their budget. I have 80000 of surplus right now that I'm going to be able to spend to get kids what they need in terms of uniforms and equipment. Okay. We asked several months ago for your uh, schedule for uniform replacement. I have never seen it. Um, actually, last time I, I did present it, and I do have it in my hand. Okay, I don't have it. Okay, you weren't at that board meeting. Can I approach it? Approach you and give it to you? Yes. Okay. Uh, because because the, the problem that I'm having with all this is, and from what I'm hearing from the board, is our middle school kids have been deprived of uniforms because all the money is being used at the high school on football uniforms and such. Um, actually, we did buy new uniforms for both basketball, uh, girls and boys basketball. That was by that was by a directive by us. And and it was purchased. And yes. We also purchased uh, um, track uniforms for Kearney Middle School because they have over. Um, they have between 80 and 90 kids participating in, in track right now. But do you understand, sir, where I'm going with all this? Is the accountability and <coughs> our reputation of our district and kids is being sacrificed by your decision making on who gets uniforms and when they get uniforms? Um, if, if I can speak to that, um, I actually compiled uh, uniforms of three years at Kearney Middle School and also at Adam City middle school so we have that schedule set up and they have been working on their purchases and I've been working on my purchases making sure that we don't go beyond that three years and we've actually met that in each case in every sport I'm letting you know which sports are coming up cross country has not had anything purchased in three years football has not any had anything purchased in three years girls soccer and uh, in cross country uh, football so is that at equity across the board is that varsity football or JV or freshman or which football team is that generally when we do purchases we purchase for varsity and then the then the other jerseys we have we pass down to JV we do what we can within the budget that we have so when was the last time the varsity jerseys were replaced um, over three years ago so our JV kids are gonna be wearing four-year jerseys and our freshman kids are gonna be wearing five-year jerseys is that correct because it just trickles down? That's what's been done in the past. I think as I sit down and I start talking uh, with Sandra Rotella on budget, um, I've looked at and compiled what we've purchased over the last three years, what I've purchased this year, and then we'll factor that into the next year's budget. Um, I've done, um, I believe, to the request of the board to be looking at uniforms um, for both middle school and high school and, and, and getting that together and doing it on an equitable cycle. And we have actually done it uh, financially sound. So, Kelly, has a, a RFP been done? No. So, board policy, 15000 back to that, he needs to submit the RFP and the bid needs to go out because you just can't say BSN and East Bay are the two um, vendors for this, what he's trying to purchase. Right. So, j for clarification, okay. 
Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, just for clarification, so the board policy uh, for uh, formal solicitations is at ten thousand dollars for a unit price. The things he's doing are probably going to be less unit price than that. In aggregate, it's going to be more than that, and that's when back on March 22nd of last year that the board uh, re lowered the limit to bring to the board to $15,000 in aggregate. So what's happening is even though uh, Mr. Liddell has not hit $15,000 in aggregate for his purchases throughout the district, middle schools, elementary schools, and now him, in combination, they're, they're at that cusp of the $15,000 mark. So it's one of those situations, like I explained back then, is it's a bit challenging because person one doesn't know what person two or person three is doing. Collectively, they're all accumulating to this aggregate spend, and he's drawn the short straw because that's when we finally noticed that collectively for those two particular vendors, it's going to be 15000 but that's different than competitive bidding. Bidding's at ten thousand dollars. Okay, um, Dr. Brago, I mean, I'm, I'm not to vote no, but I'm asking, can you look into this because there's no numbers for us. How many cross country is it? Boys or girls? There's no um, softball. Uh, how many numbers? There's no numbers in there. Just all we have is a fifteen thousand. And board policy states, if we go on by board policy, he needs to do the proper paperwork. And it's not saying that, no, we don't want to help our kids. That's not what I'm asking. But if we go on by board policy, it, must, it has to be done correctly. So I believe that's kind of the plan basically is he's wanting to know that it's okay with the board to go above the 15,000 even though he hasn't doesn't have a cap in there I, I believe what he was talking about earlier is that he knows what the budget maximum is and so he's going to stay within what he has budgeted for athletics in that particular category and Bridge was $22,000 yeah. 22,000 but that's mentioned. not what's in front of the board 15,000 is in front of the board so if we gonna go by board policy, said exceed. and that's what we all it says, 15, exceeding fifteen thousand. If we are going to do board policy, he has to do it the correct way to bring it in front of this board for us to prove it. This is not the correct way, and this is, as you say, Kelly, water under the bridge. This is not the correct way. Right. Well, I think it's it's depends on what area we want to focus in on. And I think there's also some interpretation on the way this thing is written because I can read it one way where I think you're reading it in that you're, you're understanding he's asking to spend $15,000. No. No? It said exceeding $15,000. Right. Yes, right. That's what I'm interpreting. Right. And I think the intent is because, again, collectively, it's all going to be over 15000 I think that's what, what this was intended for. We still have to do that that bidding process if those numbers look like it has to fall within the board policy. But then you're asking this board to approve 15, 20,000, 30,000. We as a board don't know what the outcome of the dollar sign is going to be. Right. So board policy, that's all I've been hearing since the superintendent has came into the district is we're going to do things by board policy. This is not board policy. Am I correct or am I wrong? Help me out. I, I, I haven't exceeded the 15000 so I haven't done anything against board, board policy. I'm asking for a request to spend the rest of my budget to, to start tapping into um, getting fall started. And when it comes down to um, you know purchasing uniforms for the different uniforms, if it's above $2,500, we need three competitive quotes. So we always do that. We get the quote, we go through the, the, the proper purchase order procedure. Um, at that time, once I talk to coaches, we do inventory, which I have done at, during every season, um, and ask every coach from middle school um, and my school to compile that list, go on the three-year cycle. I see, based on the inventory, which sports have not had that, um, that opportunity to buy the equipment or the uniforms. And, and what I'm saying is, if you do give this increase, we have money in the budget um, to do it this year. Um, and essentially what we're doing is, is we will have our equipment ready next year. And, and, and we've actually, we, we've done, we've bought more this year, 
under that bottom line of, of what the budget started at. I'm not, I'm not spewing how you, how you did it. Only thing I'm saying is if we're going to do it correctly, we're going to do it by the board policy correctly. This is not the correct way to do it. And if you do it the wrong way, somebody else will come. Somebody else will come. And that's why we're trying to do board policy. So, again, I'm asking Dr. Brago, we are not, I'm not saying no, or I got the board. This is not board policy. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not exactly sure on everything we're saying here, but Ms. Mr. Thomas, this is what happened. I did meet with the athletic director because he had different um, spending areas. Mm -hmm. I did sit back, sit down with him and say, uh, and, and informed him that you're going to go over that 15000 And if you're going to go over that 15000 we have to put it on the board agenda. And that's what he's doing right here, right now. He's trying to follow policy so that he can go over the 15000 That's That's not board policy. That's not board policy. Well, I can help add. I think what's, what we're struggling with here is that <coughs> normally the superintendent recs, when we cumulatively go up, just like we buy Chromebooks from Dell, we bring, a, we bring forward and says, can we purchase from Dell not to exceed X dollar amount? That is missing in this superintendent rec, which is what I think Mr. Thomas is trying to point out. It just is saying an amount over 15,000. Are we saying it's 17? Are we saying it's 25? Are we saying it's 50? And normally those super recs come with that cap. I believe what Mr. Ledeau's intentions are is that he would, he's coming forward to ask you, can can he spend up to the $20,000 for BSN and the other vendor, East, East Bay, um, at $22,000 there? Even though he's making several different purchases, it could be girls' soccer, and those uniforms might be $1,600, which are below the $2,500. They might do girls' tennis, and that could be $2,600, and then he would have to get bids. Or we could do football reconditioning helmets, and that's over 10000 and you would have to do the formal RFP because it's a project over the ten. So there's a lot of little sundry things that fall in there that he still needs to comply with, but our board policy also directs us that if we're going to spend in, in an accumulative number over 15000 the board needs to give approval for that, too, to any one vendor. So that's where he's at in this approval process right now. It's just the soup rec isn't quite articulating that. What, what, what I would like to see is exactly how many uniforms we are purchasing. Yeah, more detail in there and than what your plan is. You know, graduating from the school district and playing sports, I know how it's important for to have a person have a uniform. And to have our ninth graders always wear hand-me-downs is not acceptable. Okay. And I think you need to think outside the box on purchasing items. Also, is the lacrosse stuff in this fifteen thousand? Um, that is encumbered, but it's not coming out of the general athletic fund. But it did. No, it did not. It has not been purchased. And and I will explain that because I know this has been a question. Um, I sat. This was a grant from twenty first century. Um, we're now in the second year of that club sport. Um, that money will be coming out of our um, um, discretionary fund. I have sat down. I have talked to both Denise and Eleanor. We will be working with the lacrosse team. They have actually had students pay $20. We didn't have them pay the $35 athletic fee because it's not under CHASA. They have their own club account. That money's going into the account, just like I've saved a lot of the money this year working on game management. They, as a club, will actually be working our track meet, working our um, um, our, our swim invitational and they will actually be selling at some events. They're actually making money and then they're going to transfer it back into those discretionary funds. I was helping them get jump started with their club. Did I hear you correctly that you said you have not purchased the equipment or stuff yet? For I have course? not purchased the equipment. It has been encumbered. Hmm. Now, the equipment, and I have emails, and I'll, and I'll talk to you about this. Um, BSN actually sent the equipment out before a PO was ever issued. That was a mistake between the vendor not following our process of doing a quote. That showed up, 
and then it was encumbered. But it is we have not actually we have not done a PO for it because I have actually waited to see if we're going to to see if I can get a raise with BSN. But that's coming out of discretionary funds. This is all in the best interest of the kids and you supporting just came in them. In front of us, sir, and said that you did not have any of the equipment or uniforms here yet. In reality, you do. Sir, you asked if I had purchased them, and I had not. They have been encumbered. Split when you hairs, asked. sir. Okay. This was a BSN mistake, and Let's, it was uh, encumbered, and, and we have not done a PO for it. On this, you okay. two get together and with Dr. Abrego and go over this. Let's not do it here in public. Is there any other questions? Um, I'm not going to vote on this tonight because I would like to see the exact number of uniforms we are purchasing. Fair. Plus the way that. it says exceeding 15000 I think we need a, a definite, defined amount of money that's being, being used, although yeah. it's within your budget. I'll get quotes. Um, I think that's only fair. Absolutely, and that's what I've done for every purchase. Quotes, gone through the, the PO process, um, done inventory with all the, co uh, all the coaches, and actually followed that three-year three cycle that I was asked to, to begin doing with middle schools and high schools. All right, any other questions? All right, Mike, can we have a roll call, please? Or oh, women, go ahead. I'd like to make a motion that we table this <clears throat> so it's done so we don't vote yes or no. Because now we're not doing board policy if we board, if we vote yes, because we do want to get these students the the right uniforms. But this policy, this superintendent recommendation, needs to be done correctly. So I would like to make a motion that we table this till we can get it correct and bring it back to the board. Okay, there has been a motion made to table this one point two until we can get the uh, numbers on how, where the money is going to be spent is there a second second is there a discussion uh, i would just like to say because i order uniforms all the time for baseball and for all my teams if we motion this and we table it it cuts back into the time limit that we get these uniforms in for, I, I guess you said the fall sports, am I correct? L looking at fall sports and... Especially if they are custom made. So we got to be careful. If we're going to do this, and I have a proposal here at the end of this on communications that we not meet next board, so that would put us all the way into April, the second week in April. Now, I don't know how long... It takes BESN or, or uh, them to get your uniforms. I don't know exactly what you're ordering, but let's just make sure that if we do this, that we want to make sure that those uniforms or whatever equipment you're ordering are here for the beginning of the fall season. Yeah. Uh, is that enough time for you to get your numbers together and bring it, put it back on the agenda for the next board meeting in April and get everything lined out? Yes, currently right now, girls soccer was on that three-year cycle, and they're, they're waiting on, on uniforms, and I have not gone through it. I, I, I have a few quotes out there right now. Um, I would like to get girls soccer um, new uniforms. It's, it's been uh, five years since they've been purchased, and, and again, I'm just, I'm just trying to follow what, what you guys had asked um, and get all these, these sports teams that have gone three years without uniforms um, looking properly, um, feeling good about themselves. I, I understand what you're saying, but it goes back to the back to this main fact that this is wrong. Simple, simple as that is wrong. If, it's the, if you're going to let the policy, you might as well vote yes and then let everybody come and don't do it. If we're not going to stop it now and have it, the procedure correct, then what the purpose of us sitting up here for? If the policy states this is wrong. Now we finna deviate from the policy to say because of sports? Kids need books. T kids need, teachers need this and that and this and that. But we, 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 we crossing hairs about uniforms that the policy is wrong they should have a um, kelly need to probably say do a, a, a study session and teach them how to do it right but if we're going to sit up here and say uniforms is important 
and then you want to vote yes because we're not having a board meeting in two weeks, then we wrong. The pop, if it's wrong, it's wrong. The students won't suffer, and he know and I know, and everybody in this room know, he can ship the order faster. We might have to pay a little bit more, but we know that these uniforms can get here. But the main problem is what we're sitting in here is it is done wrong. The policy states is wrong, period. So let me ask you a question, Joe. Yes, sir. Um, if you purchased girls soccer uniforms are you under your budget um under our bottom line but we would go over the fifteen thousand dollars and that's why i'm here even today. if you just bought the girls soccer team the girls yes, soccer yes uniforms. sir yes so basically when you saying you just taking the girls soccer team and saying that's fifteen thousand no i'm um, it's it's it, if you it, take the cross country team you adding another Ten to fifteen thousand. You take the football team. So you saying one? We saying one sport is fifteen thousand. It 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 it's not, sir. It's not. It it varies anywhere from five hundred dollars to two thousand dollars. It it really does when when we're talking about uniforms. So that comes back to my question. If yes. you're going towards the soccer uniforms, they must be have to be simple, because the season's already started. I mean. They start at the same time baseball has, and we already have four ball games. Yeah. And I don't know how many Skyview has already, but if we were to say, okay, go ahead and get your soccer uniforms, it may not be till the end of this, almost till the end of the season before they got it. I mean, if you're going to go custom. Uh, a quote's already out there, um, but I have not gone ahead with any purchase order. Um, I do have a quote um, specifically for soccer. Um, we do have a design already made. But, yeah, they they could be printed that, tomorrow. It, who's the company that's going to design it? Uh, BSN does all that. So does East Bay. And what's their, what's their promise on turnarounds? I think if they were to start printing tomorrow, it would be anywhere from like 7 to 10 days. That's good. Maybe less if I rushed it. That's just speculation, though, correct? Uh, no, sir. I, I speak to Rich, the uh, uh, the consultant for BSN, pretty consistently. Any other questions? Okay. Can, can I just add one thing? I, I just want to make sure. I don't want to see anything get stalled if, if un, unnecessarily. That's the main reason I want to talk. So let's just talk uh, BSN sports. So, so what he's been doing, you know, uh, team uniforms or small purchases basically, most of them have been falling under the board policy as far as competitiveness goes. Um, and then he has to get quotes at the 2500 mark. The 15000 thing is still about the collective spend with one vendor, despite who it is. So as a whole, between the middle schools and the high school with BSN, they're at over $14,000 collectively. And so per that board the policy- two different orders multiple purchase orders right um and so uh over the school year so far so again just because of his alignment and where the orders have been placed we've got to that spot to where it's the fifteen thousand dollar mark which is where the board wants to uh, pre-approve going above that mark and that's really what this was supposed to be so so from my perspective for the most part that i know of he's been following policy as far as competitive uh, competitiveness goes the real issue is he was the one that we identified that's going to push it over fifteen thousand dollars total which means getting board pre-approval to go above fifteen thousand dollars and I think that's what the intent was that that super rec is is missing a cap you know and that might have helped in this situation um, it may not have identified particular uniforms because again it was small dollars and and he may or may not know what those are yet but i'm comfortable at this point in time based on what i know that he's been following policy as far as the competitiveness goes the real issue is the fact that at bsn we're at fourteen thousand and some dollars and so his his next order if he's the next one that places an order with bsn is going to push us over that amount and and we've told him you can't do it we've we've stopped an order because he's the lucky one that's been identified that's hit the fence. 
And that's what this was really supposed to be. So let me ask you a question. So if, let's say if you go and spend $2,000 with uh, Sportsline, then you go and spend another $2,000 with uh, Colorado Springs Sports Center over there, another 2000 over at uh, – there. they don't have to come in front of the board once they exceed it? I, I, I don't understand. When I saw this 15000 I thought you were spending, say, football is the one that's going to cost 15000 by the time you get the helmets, the shoulder pads and everything. I thought this was what – but I'm all confused now. So because we have been ordering different orders with BSN – I don't understand. That's not 15000 or, or what are we doing here? Right. So let's just talk about one vendor because it might make it a little bit easier. Again, it's all about the total aggregate spend over time. That, that's what the board set in place back on March 22nd last year is, is um, requesters are supposed to seek approval, pre-approval, before exceeding 15000 That competitive piece, that's, that's a different thing. But there was about how much was being spent. And so that challenge then is, like your example exactly, you have one middle school buying from them, you have the other middle school buy from them, you have the high school buy from them. All of them have been within their, their competitive limits, but we've reached that $15,000 mark. And so by policy, we're, we're telling them, no, you got to go to the board to ask to go above. So at that point, he's not really asking about in particular any particular uniform. It's all about aggregate spend at one vendor. In and this case, he's got two of them going on. It's, so it's then my question would be, if I was the athletic director, why go with BSNN? Why go with East Bay? Why not, wouldn't I go with Sportsline, and then I don't have to come in front of the board to ask for that money, correct? Well, you'd probably run into the same issue because athletics is such a big, big uh, spend. Um, you know, he could split it. He could split it out even more, and he'd never hit the fifteen thousand dollar mark. There's there's some economy of scale sometimes by partnering with certain companies, uh, as far as building relationships, uh, expediency of of your orders. Um, sometimes there's additional discounts, value added components that might be offered by those particular vendors. So he could have, what we call in our side of the world, split transactions. He could have picked another vendor and started from zero. And worked his way up and then stopped at 15 and then you would never know about it and that's so, what i would have done so kelly just to clarify for me so the middle schools spend their own money and you spend for the high school is that correct they have their own yeah. so how do we get a price break and how do we get a price deal if three people are ordering different at different times i think part of that the vendor knows no the vendor doesn't know the vendor is in business to make money well there's that too not in our best interest mm -hmm. So how are we getting the best bang for our buck, per se? Well, I did throughout this whole process, originally, um, and, and I do know this, East Bay for the past three years had really only been the sole vendor, um, at least with the high school. Um, looking at those competitive quotes from East Bay, um, I was... I was introduced to BSN. I had did some competitive quotes. They came in even even lower than East Bay. Um, I know that Sportsline and uh, Denver Sports is also used by by the middle schools. Um, and throughout this entire process of building the relationships, um, I, I get the competitive quotes. And not only do we also are part of a program where where you spend a certain amount of money with that certain company. Um, for instance, we have not had to buy um, any polos this year, which was a big money saver. So for example, we spent uh, for boys basketball was was seven thousand dollars with BSN. It was about six thousand dollars with East Bay and both companies gave coaching gears back for free Nike gear. So so that's that that's part of the connection with with certain with certain companies. Thank you. Okay, so we have a motion on the board to table this, I guess. So can we have roll call, Monica? Mr. Archuleta? Nay. Mr. Dryling? Aye. Mrs. Quintana? Nay. Mr. Rola? Nay. Mr. Thomas? Yay. Okay, going back, uh, if that's all discussion, then going back to the original, since the table didn't pass, can we have roll call, Monica? Aye. Mr. Darling? Nay. Mrs. Quintana? 
Aye. Mr. Rollins? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Nay. Okay. Moving on to 1.3, superintendent's recommendation. I need a motion for the approval of IRIS grant fund contract between Adams 14 and the Community Reach Center Systems Incorporation. So moved. Second. Okay, is there any discussion? Hearing none, can we have roll call, Monica? Mr. Archuleta? Aye. Mr. Dryling? Aye. Mrs. Quintana? Aye. Mr. Rola? Aye. Aye. Moving on to 1.4, superintendent's recommendation. I need a motion for the approval to renew Loki Incorporation contract for the fiscal year of 2017-2018. So moved. Is there a second? Okay, uh, hearing none, then I guess uh, it's not approved. Going on to 1.5, superintendent's recommendation. I need a motion for the approval to submit 2017-2018 priority, priority IE rate applications. So moved. Is there a second? Hearing none, then there was, that one is out the window. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Good evening, board. I know it's been a late night um, with lots of great discussion. Um, if I could back up for one second to the ILOCA, this is the renewal of the contract for the district's phone system. Without the renewal of this contract, we don't have a phone system. The second um, superintendent's recommendation that you're on right now is our request to submit for E-rate funds from the federal government. This is us asking for permission to submit our application, and you'll see the total amounts that we ask for that support the techno technological infrastructure of the district. I'd be pleased to answer any questions you have about either Priority 1 or Priority 2 services. And, and if I collaborate, I, I believe uh, the one I'm looking at is the approval to submit the 2017-18 Priority uh, E-rate we actually only paid 10% of that, so we're requesting $173,000, but we, we only paid 10%, 17000 Am I correct, Teresa? That is correct. So each year, uh, Adams 14 qualifies to apply for, um, and you can see the details in each of the two superintendent's recommendations, um, the infrastructure that supports our wireless, our servers, our network, um, and in addition to, we have a couple years remaining where the federal government is supporting our phone system before we will have to invest heavily of our own funds to be able to have our phone system operate here in the district. Um, the first superintendent's recommendation that's already gone by with ILOCA um, is, you'll see that one, is the 42540 but the second to last year in the next page you'll see um, where the district only has to pay 29778 of that if you approve um, our ability to request funds from the federal government. So the one before this, the one you're on now, and the one after this work in tandem. The... Um ILOCA, is there a competitive bid out there so for, it, the, for in the service? The, if you go to page 13 of your packet, I don't know if we have the same packet or not, in the asterisks there, um, you'll see that we have a contract that is a 10-year term, and at the end, and in that contract, it allows us to renew each year. And in conversation with our procurement department, we've determined that we will go to bid in the next year because we are getting a very good rate right now, and if we go to bid, it's likely to be higher. In addition to... Um, we are using an outdated, antiquated um, phone system. It's time to move to something new, but the cost to that will go out to RFI um, to anticipate what is that lift going to be look like, look like because the federal government is no longer going to support voice services in this capacity. Teresa, is this the one that we would get the, some money back? That is correct. The, every year we that approve is correct. it? Mm -hmm. So you see, if we look at, um, for example, on Priority 1, um, for the approval to submit 2017-18 Priority 1 E-rate application, the yearly cost of the wide area network 
the gigabyte internet service that we have, that's our upload download speed, um, and the district telecom would be $250,680 cost to the district if we didn't go for E-rate funds. Um, our E-rate request that we're put, asking your permission for to put forward to the federal government um, would cover $200,088, and the district's cost would only be $50,592 if we're fully awarded, and typically we are fully awarded because we qualify at a high level because of the population that we serve in Commerce City. And if I could direct your attention, since I have the microphone, to the next page. I'm going for it, Mr. Dryling. <laughs> um, you'll see those, there's a lot of zeros added behind that next page. These are priority two E-rate applications. This is the hardware that we are um, asking for. You'll see the total cost to the district would be $541,000 if we're not awarded E-rate funds, whereas with our E-rate funds being approved, the district cost is only $81,000. So you can see this is a significant investment, and um, we ask <laughs> sort of begging for your approval to request these funds from the federal government. The technology services team has put in hours of work um, identifying the district's needs from an architectural standpoint to make this request in the best interest of the district moving forward so that when we bring on 1,200 new Chromebooks, we have behind the walls and in the ceilings ready to support that work. Teresa, going back to I, um, is it ILOCA? Mm -hmm. um, is there any chance beyond this next year to extend our current contract with them at this price? I believe so, um, but we are we would be on the hook for essentially the entire forty two thousand um, dollars at some point, and it needs. Honestly, it needs to be next year. Um, the issue with our phone system is that because our buildings are so outdated, our schools are currently using their PA systems through the phone system. So in order for me to replace the phone system, I also need to come up with a PA system for schools. And we could be looking at, I'm going to throw out a number with a lot of zeros behind it, but I want us to understand and be on the same page with the reality of $500,000 um, because our phone system is that outdated and it impacts the school AP systems. And because such a large purchase of such, and we don't staff an individual that is an expert in you know, voice over IP, we would need to put out a request for information for vendors to help us identify what are our next steps, what do we need to do, how do we go about scoping this type of work um, so that we would even know where to start to go to an RFP. So we need this year to lay that groundwork to be able to um, put forth a very expensive um, request for you. Mr. President, uh, would it be out of line if we went back to 1.4 and uh, took a motion to re-vote on that. Motion to reconsider. To reconsider. Uh, okay, I guess I need to have a, a vote on that to see if we want to reconsider 1.4. So can we have roll call, Monica, please? Mr. Archuleta? Aye. Mr. Dryman? Aye. Mrs. Quintana? Aye. Mr. Rola? Aye. Mr. Aye. Okay, going back to 1.4, I need a motion for the approval of to renew a LOCA Incorporation's contract for fiscal year 2017-2018. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, can we have roll call, Monica? Mr. Archuleta? Aye. 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 Now moving on. Uh, for 1.5, superintendent's recommendation, I need a motion for the approval to submit 2017-2018 priority IE rate applicants. So, so moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, can I have roll call, Monica? Mr. Archuleta? Aye. 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 Moving Aye. on. Oh, I'm sorry. Moving on to superintendent's recommendation 1.6. I need a motion for the approval to submit 2017-2018 priority 2E uh, rate application. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, can we have roll call, Monica? Mr. Archuleta? Aye. 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 1.7 was tabled, so moving on to 1.8, superintendent's recommendation. I need a motion for the approval to award the request for proposal RFP-numbers 
1617-134 for auditing services to Clinton Larson Allen. Allen. Allen LLP. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? I, I have a comment. I had the opportunity to sit on that uh, board when we did the final interviews, and our uh, our guys in purchasing Kelly and, and Eddie and Sandy, they did a, a fabulous job on um, whittling these uh, potential clients down and I believe the one that we were unanimous agreed on is is going to give us the biggest bang for our buck. Any other? Hearing none, can we have roll call, Monica? Mr. Archuleta. Aye. Mr. Darling. Aye. Ms. Aye. 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 Moving on to 1.9, superintendent's recommendation approval to award the entertainment Request for proposal RFP number 1617-140 for a God, I can't even read this. Dismiss Dis machine. Dis machine and tile. Tilt skillet. Or tilt skillet to United Restaurant Supplies. So moved. Second. Okay, is there any discussion? Hearing none, can we have roll call, Monica? Aye. 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 Okay, man, I'm glad that's done. Next time I bring my right glasses. <laughs> uh, moving on to communication. Um, on March 28th is the next time that we're supposed to meet, and that is the week of uh, spring break. So... I am recommending that uh, maybe we postpone that meeting because we don't want to hold a lot of our administrators to come back to our meeting. And so it's nice for them to get a break from the school district also. So I guess I am proposing or I'm motioning that we not have a meeting on March 28th. Second. Is there any discussion? Can we have roll call, Monica? Mr. Archuleta. Aye. Mr. Dryling. Aye. Mrs. Quintana. Aye. Mr. Rola. Aye. Mr. Thomas. Aye. Okay, also under communication, uh, we need a board retreat with CASB Director Randy Black. Uh, and again, I guess we wouldn't have to have a date and how long we would want it. Now, he has given us numerous dates, but uh, before we do, is there anybody that has a specific date that they'd like to do? Is it going to be all day? Well, that's what we got to oh, okay. do. That's what we got to decide. How long do we want? A half a day, full day? It's in the paper there that was handed out there. A Friday work, would work best for me. Friday? What time, Joe? Anytime. Okay, and how long do we want to have it? Do we want a full day or just half a day? Half a day. Half, half a day. day? Okay, half a day, afternoon or morning? I was going to say full day. <laughs> let's let's uh, leave it up to him, and he tells us what he can do morning or afternoon. I mean, are we that flexible? Uh, I am, I mean, unless I have a ball game. Mm -hmm. What? Do those dates look okay? So. You're talking about the 17th, right? 17th of March? Does that be next week? It's this um, Friday. In the walkthrough? This Friday, but I thought you wanted to do a walkthrough yeah, this Friday. but we could do both, right? No. I don't know. It's up to. It doesn't matter to me. No. All right. Okay. So I guess seventeenth is out, or do we want to do a first? Let's propose. Do we want to do the walkthrough on the seventeenth? Yeah, I prefer we do the walkthrough. Okay. How about um, April seventh, which is on a Friday? April seventh. He says any time. Yeah. Okay. That'll work for you. So if he says any time, would we want morning or afternoon? Afternoon. Pardon me? Afternoon, some of us Afternoon? might want to sleep in. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Who sleeps in? <laughs> so let's say Friday, April 7th at noon, in the afternoon sometime. Is that That's good enough? Friday night. No. Mm -hmm. We could go from what? <laughs> noon to 4? No noon to 5? Noon to 4? Noon to 5? That's good. Noon to 5? Okay. 
I think it's actually a four-hour session is what how he blocks it off. So oh. we might have questions. Mm -hmm. So noon or one, one to four, five. If it's a four-hour session, then it'd be twelve to four or one to five. Twelve to four would work for me. Twelve to four. Yeah, that's good. Okay, <laughs> twelve to four. Then I guess we go out and eat before we come here. We've already eaten, so we don't have to order no food. You always say that. All right. Okay. Do you have that, Monica? Can you get back with it more, Dr. Abrego? Yes. Okay. So that one's set. Other than that, I guess, uh, you know, communication is that we had a DAC meeting and it was pretty good. There was a lot of people there and a lot of people took part. My only recommendation, Dr. Abrego or uh, Mr. Archuleta, I don't see him here, is that maybe on presentations, let's try to keep it down to maybe 20 minutes. Because I know after 20 minutes, I was looking around and I, Harvest and Timmy and I were looking around and everybody starts playing with their phones and we lose interest. So if we can just keep the speakers down to about 20 minutes. Okay. okay. Or you could turn, have them turn in all their phones. Yeah, I'm always going to tell them to turn in their phones. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Um, Rolla, is it appropriate for me to make a few comments right now or announcements? Uh, I just want to say I want to thank the board for allowing Ms. Uh, Hernandez to speak because, you know, it's very important that our district qualifies for a lot of federal funds and for us to take advantage of that. I mean, we can get a million dollars and only pay 10 percent. So thank you for helping us with that. That was very important. Also, this Saturday, we did have a parent institute at the high school uh, and we had over 100 individuals attend that. So that's going very well. Um, and then we did take a team to go see the state board presentation, uh, the turnaround hearing from another district. That was, it's similar like ours. They have an external partner. So uh, when we meet, I'll try to help our board as far as the support we're going to need from you to make sure that we get that pass from the state board. And then just last, it's that time of the year where our students are taking the part test in March and April. So we're going to knock on wood, and I think we've done all the – things we can do to prepare our students so now it's up to them to prove their worth that's all I have okay and I believe Harvest you had something you want to communicate yes communication um, asking the board for us to take a district tour um, this Saturday at the district Saturday. I mean Friday so whatever good time for the district the board and uh, I think why don't you explain your purpose why you the purpose of the, the, the district for us to tour the district is um, for the past couple of years uh, we had 1.1 million for capital reserve projects we uh, last year we had 1.3 million capital reserve projects in the district this give us the opportunity as board members to walk around see the district not going in classrooms but tour the district for ourselves to see what we can see for us um, and we're doing the budget so this is a time for us to understand, too, what we want to do as far as budget priorities with the budget. So uh, just taking a district tour to let us see the district for ourselves and understand what's going on and not hearsay of what's going on. Okay. I just want to note there, uh, Mr. Thomas, that if we vote on it, it has to be open to everybody. Is that fine with you? I don't care. Because it's it'll be considered a board meeting. I don't care. Okay. So I guess my next thing, I don't know if we take a roll or do we have a consensus to have a board meeting. I guess we would have to call it a board meeting on so Friday. And have to post it Thursday. Thursday. Yeah. 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 Right. I would uh, need three written requests. I three written requests. You need to do three? three okay, three of us at least would have to send in that How they many, would like a special board have, meeting Monica? on Friday. Monica says she has two. She has two. Which ones does she have them from? Harvest and I think Joe. Are those the two? Who do, who do yeah. yeah. Okay. Now the next thing, Harvest, what time would that would you like to have? Whatever's open. What's the best time for? That's cute. What's good for you? To me is any time, but I would have to be done by 3 30 because I have ball practice at 4. And I won't be able to because you know I've been working on my brother's uh, 
house to get it prepared for him uh, to return home because, you know, he was, I don't know if anybody knew, but he was very sick. Uh, he had a knee replacement and he got his leg amputated and so we're making it accessible for him and getting his house ready. So that's why I have not been at a lot of functions. Uh, I've basically been his caregiver for about two years now. So I'm trying to make it so he can come home and I've only had the nicer days to do that. So I w really wouldn't be able to make it. Sorry. So what time for th the other four? How about noon? Noon? Because we're not going to get all 15 in one day. No. There's no way. So I, I think we should just pick three or four that we really want to look at. Yeah. What three or four? Well, I think the high school for sure. Okay. Is that agreeable? Oh, I'm fine. With yeah. Whatever. And one of the middle schools and then two elementary schools. How about AC yeah. Middle? Huh? How about AC Middle? AC Middle? High school, AC Middle? Yeah. And what other, what elementary? We can do Alsup since we're right there. We can hit Alsup. Okay, Alsup. And we can do Hanson since it's right next door to the high school. city. Okay. High school. Now, right? do we need a bus or do we need to just go in our own cars or? With the district, they're supposed to provide us a bus. <laughs> they provide us a bus? Yeah. Okay, can you get a bus? Can we Scott, get a bus we need or a, a big van? bus. We need a bus. There's who's here? Scott? I thought Scott was here. I'm on my motorcycle. Can we get a bus or a van or something for? I won't be able to drive it, but I can get you a bus. I don't know. Can, right. we, can we just drive there ourselves? And I, mean, well, I don't know. That's what I'm asking. I'm going on my motorcycle. So. Yeah, I think we should just drive there. Drive and ourselves. You can so drive we can yourself. Pay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so we got to know where we going to start first at. Adam City High School. High School, and then we go to Hanson, then to the junior high, and then to Alsa. All right. Yeah. Um, in order, only because it's a, it'll be a public meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and if there's public that I wants to attend a certain portion of it, they would have to meeting. start on time at the school as it's scheduled on the. Uh, all right. So put a timeline on how long do we want to be at each school. I think we should bring Monica with us. She could be our timekeeper and keep us on track for. As well. it has to be recorded okay. For uh, legal purposes. Here's another. A concern. If you start at noon, that's kind of in the lunch hour time frame, and there's a lot of traffic with the cafeterias, so you might want to, I'm just saying, maybe, what time did you say? Well, some of the schools have lunch from 11 to 1 o'clock. That's what I'm saying. So it does, we're, going to, we're not going in the classrooms, I don't think, per se. We're just I know, but I'm see. just saying in the traffic, if you go at the high school, there, it's really populated in those halls. We can take our security fellow here. He's he's big enough to protect us. He could be a pulling guard or tackle. So we so. Would, would it, you guys would you guys like a, a tour guide with keys to help you get into areas where you want to see or? That would, yeah, I think we need someone with the master key or give us or give Monica a master key or uh, Dr. Jeff. He's going to attend with us. Well, it looks like we're having a party. <laughs> okay, so we're all set for this Friday. So noon at the high school. See as much as we can in four hours. Well, 12 to 3.30 is the time frame, right? 12 to 4. I thought they, that's just for me. Oh. Yeah. Okay. 12 to 4. Are you going to be there too? So we try to see as much as we can in the district. Unless I come dressed in my Skyview outfit so I can... No, you can change and change. <laughs> no sky blue. Just change the shirt. <laughs> okay. Is there anything else for the good of the cause? I got one other thing. I, I want to thank our communications department because uh, our we had some a lot of material on our website, school district website that was outdated. Uh, we had videos on there from what, ten years ago, nine years ago, and uh, they worked very hard to get it updated. Yes. And if you guys have a chance, go on there and look at stuff. It's it's updated and looks very very nice. Good. 
How about changing these pictures? They're, mm. they're kind of old. They've been here since I think we got on. Mm -hmm. can, can we do that? Okay. You're you're an all star. Okay. Anything school, else? So we mean at the high school at twelve. High school noon. Right. Let's just meet where they're putting up the eagle. Where's right that? in that little lobby. Oh, okay. Okay, and then we can go from there. All right. Any other? All right. I need a motion to adjourn at this time. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Okay, we are adjourned at 840. Hey, Timmy, oh. Roll call. oh, I need roll call.